All right, well, welcome to our uh, next edition of our Southeast Indiana Gardening a &R series. Uh, we have with us uh, a great presenter today. We have Gardening with the Elements, and we have our uh, speaker for today is Kara Hams. Kara is our Extension Educator in CED in Brown County. Uh, so if you have any questions, uh, just unmute your mic or put those in the chat function. So Kara, I will turn it over to you. All right, thanks Kyle and thanks everyone for joining or watching the recording. Um, as Kyle said, my name is Kara Hammes and I am the one of the educators down in Brown County in South Central Indiana. Um, and I'm excited to talk about gardening with the elements today. And I'm looking at that through the lens of sun, soil, water, and air, and basically making the most of what nature gives you. So um, as, as I mentioned, I live, in, I live and work in Brown County. And while we have some particular challenges down here, um, you know, clay soil, not that much flat ground, too much deer, and those may not be the same as whatever you're dealing with in your own home garden. There's probably some similarities and there may be things that are different. So either way, like I said, we it all comes down to that sun, soil, water, and air. Those are things plants need to survive. And um, there's some options that you can do to kind of make the most of those elements in your garden. So um, let me... Yeah, so we're gonna look at these three elements. Um, as I get into this presentation, I'm not going to go really deep into any of these four elements or any of the potential um, you know, management techniques or garden gardening options that we're gonna to touch on. This is just meant to give you an overview of some of the techniques that are out there, get you thinking about what might apply to your situation. And I've also got a pretty long list of resources that we can email out after the fact if you've registered. And so you can use that to, to dive more into topics that might be of particular interest to you or more relevant to your kind of gardening journey. So I know the, the graphic that I used, it started with sun, but um, we're actually gonna start by talking about soil since that's the basis for everything that's going on in your garden. Um, you may have heard some people when they talk about gardening, they actually might call it or refer to it as working the soil. And um, I find that that is kind of like a good indicator of how that soil is really a foundation for everything you're doing. This is really a critical component of your gardening success. And it's something that um, you may not give a lot of thought to. So I'm going to assume if you've been tuning in at all for this Southeast Indiana gardening series that somewhere along the line, at least one of the other presenters has mentioned soil testing, but I'm going to throw my, you know, endorsement into the ring and say it's really an important place to start when you're considering, um, you know, what you're going to plan to do for your garden and also as you're making specific selections of amendments, fertilizer, fertilizers, whatever it might be, you really do need to have a recent soil test and understand what you're dealing with. Because not only could you be wasting money if you're putting into practice certain management options that don't line up with what your soil actually needs, so that'd just be a waste of money. There are certain choices you could make that would actually exacerbate problems that might already be there if you, again, aren't aware of some of these measurements. So Purdue has a great publication out um, called Collecting Soil Sam Samples for Testing, and that'll be listed in that resource list that I send out. But in that um, guide, this is an example image that's included in there of what a soil test report would look like. I'm not going to go a lot into all these different specific things, but you can see it gives um, different measurements. It also helps you understand, you know, probably most of us don't under, wouldn't know off the top of our head what 19 parts per million of phosphorus meant in the context of like, is that good? Is that bad? Um, so they use this kind of graphical representation to show if that ranks, if that measurement ranks as very low to very high when they look kind of at a, a broader subset of soil samples and what would be considered typical. So that helps you kind of understand what these measurements actually mean in real world, real world terms. And then also um, the reports from this particular lab and the one that we send people, most people to 
um, if they come in in Brown County, also gives examples or suggestions of what fertilizers might be necessary. So it lists um, a measurement, it gives you a description, it tells you kind of a timing and rate. And so this is a really helpful place to start as you're thinking about things you might need to do to the soil in your garden. Um, I know in Brown County, you know, we in our office have the soil, the bags that you would use to submit samples. We have a soil sample collector, a corer that people can come and check out. And I would imagine the same is similar to most other counties in the state. So you can definitely call your county extension office to ask about getting those supplies if you haven't done a soil test recently or if you, you need to get started. And they can answer more specific questions or you can refer to this um, Purdue Extension publication about collecting samples. It's really helpful. Um, so this soil test report is really looking at like nutrient levels, organic matter percentages, a lot of really important pieces of your, you know, the profile of the soil you're gardening in. But another really important piece of soil is the soil texture. And that has to do with the percentages of sand, silt, and clay in your soil. And you may already have kind of an idea of, well, my soil is clayey or it, you know, you may have an idea of what your, your soil profile is. A kind of easy test that you can do at home is called the jar test. And it just involves adding an amount of soil to a clear glass jar. You add some water, um, a little bit of, dish soap. Again, this there's an actual step-by-step -step is listed out in one of the resources and the guide that I'll send out after the presentation, but it um, walks you through how to mix the soil, how to let it settle, when you make the marks and look at it, and then it gives you kind of these easy calculations to measure it out, do the math, and figure out what percent of sand, um, silt, and clay you have. I just saw they have a typo here, but um, and then you use this triangle basically to come in and match up percentages and it gives you kind of the category of soil that you're dealing with. So whether it's again, you know, clay or sandy clay or just how that falls. There's some other ways that you can test this. It has to do with, um, you can get a sample of your soil and if it's like wet, you kind of like rub your fingers together over the soil. And if they're sandy soils, it tends to feel sandy. It's like harsh and gritty when you're doing that, where clay and silt soils are a little bit more smooth and slippery feeling. Um, you can also form a ball of moist soil in your hand. And if it, if you like, you know, you've got it all packed together, you kind of tap that ball. Um, if it breaks apart, then it's on the sandy side. If it remains intact, then it probably has more clay and silt than sand. And if it's either, um, and if it actually acts like what you would think of as clay, like it's kind of sticky and you can kind of form it more easily, then you might have a considerable clay um, content. So those two methods, the kind of slip test or the ball method are something you can easily do outside where this jar test, again, it's easy to do at home, but this is gonna give you more, uh, more sci scientific, I guess, breakdown, a more, precise breakdown of the sand, silt, and clay composition of your soil. Um, so you may already have been dealing with this or trying to deal with, um, you know, maybe making adjustments if you have really clayey or really sandy soils. Um, one of the ways that you would do this is with soil amendments. And so this is one of those, this is an example of where I was saying it's really important to understand what you have because there are things that you can do that are gonna make the problem you have worse. And the reason it matters whether you have really clayey soil or too sandy or whatever is that um, your soil texture and structure determines the permeability of the soil. So like how easily water moves through it and also the water retention. So how long does, is water held in that soil after it's kind of come in? And this may seem obvious, but just as a um, kind of refresher, 
Sandy soil has really high permeability, so it drains really easily, but that means it doesn't hold water well. It has low water retention. Clay has low permeability. That's where it's like able to hold a puddle of water really well, um, but it has high water retention, so that water stays wet a long time. Loam is considered to be kind of the ideal combination of, of clay, sand, and silt for soil, and in that case, it would be kind of medium. Water would move through reasonably well, but it also is going to be held in the soil for a while for the plants to use. Um, but as you're looking at this, when you're thinking about potential amendments that you could add to the soil, different amendments have, and that's just something you would add, mix into the soil that would kind of break up that texture, that would add addition. Typically, it's also going to end up adding additional nutrients and other things the plants might need, but it's meant to be there to alter the structure of the soil so that you get closer to that kind of loam profile, whether you have clay soil and it's, it's breaking it up and loosening it or sand soil adding more structure. But you can see that this chart here, um, and this is included, a link of this is included in the resource list I'll send out so you can study this more closely if you're interested. But certain amendments have either, you know, this shouldn't be a surprise, but I don't know that we all really think about this that often, have low to high permeability as well as low to high water retention. So if the type of soil you're dealing with has whatever profile it has, we would want to be careful about what um, amendments we're adding because we don't want to make that soil, we don't want to exacerbate the problem we're trying to fix because we've picked an amendment that isn't appropriate for the soil we're dealing with. And um, you'll see a lot of what's listed here are organic amendments, meaning things that come from um, a natural source that are able to be broken down by microorganisms. There are a couple um, inorganic amendments listed, namely vermiculite and perlite. And I'll say one thing that I've talked with people about is if the idea is you've got either, you know, sandy or clay soil, if my problem is clay, well, shouldn't I just add sand and that would kind of solve my problem? And I want to specifically caution against that because Actually, what happens if you start to mix sand into really clay soil, you are essentially just making concrete. You're making uh, the soil actually becomes harder to work. It's it, you're not doing yourself any favors. So you'll see that even of, of these inorganic um, amendment options in this table, sand is not one of them. So in general, organic, um, and again, what I mean is like natural materials like bark, wood chips, leaves, other things, compost, aged compost, are what would be recommended as a soil amendment. So um, that's just something to consider as you're considering the soil tests that you've received, um, the you know soil texture to take into consideration when you're trying to make a plan for your garden. Um, another resource I'll send out looks at some more specifics. This is actually looking at mulch. So guess I'll switch to talking about that. Some of these mulches can also be soil amendments. But um, when we're dealing with soil, again, like I said, I'm probably going to talk the most about this one because it is such a foundational piece of what you're dealing with in your garden. But we've looked at, you know, nutrient levels. We've looked, we've talked about um, texture. Another piece to really consider in your garden is mulching. And the reason that this relates back to the soil and how it's helping um, is mulch does a couple of things for you. It, one is that it helps prevent water loss from the soil by evaporation. So it just helps um, keep the soil moist for longer, meaning that the water is there and available for the plants to use. It also helps reduce the growth of weeds depending which mulch you use. You'll see some of the mulches listed in this table, and I'm sure you may have had experiences with this. Some mulches can actually introduce weed seeds, which can be a problem. But in general, if you're laying down a thick enough layer, it's going to smother out those weeds and help um, reduce weed growth. It also helps keep the soil cooler in the summer and warmer in the winter. It's basically acting as a layer of insulation for the soil, 
which keeps the soil temperature more even and that can help with your plants. Um, another benefit is there are certain soil borne diseases, um, may, I think especially one for tomatoes that are transmitted by soil basically getting splashed up onto the plant over the course of the growing season. And so mulch can help reduce that splashing and help prevent disease transmission. And it also helps control erosion and a lot of these mulches um, are going to be organic, which means they're going to decay, which means ultimately they're going to get worked into your soil and help be an amendment as well, like we were just talking about. Um, so those are just some, some examples of what mulching can do for you. And if you've been gardening for any length of time, I think you'll recognize the, the benefits of kind of those little bullet points I just went through. Um, but this table goes into some more specifics and things you might want to be aware of or take, you know, may move you away from picking a particular mulch. Um, like, for instance, grass clippings, it says may contain weed seeds um, and can mat down when wet. And so these are just things, but grass may be what you have most readily available. That may be what it makes sense for you to use, but you should understand that those are some of the trade offs when you're using it. There are other um, outside of these kind of organic or maybe more traditional options. There are other options that you may use, especially depending on the size of your garden, the size of your operation. Um, one is plastic mulch. You may have seen these used in like large row crop or um, more commercial setups, but it, it is something that can be used in a home garden. And you'll see this even breaks down black versus clear plastic. There's even certain crops may use like red or blue or silver and all of those um, different plastic mulches have different benefits to the plant when it comes to reflectivity. I think I've got another table that looks at that, but um, yeah, they do different things as far as soil temperature, weed suppression, um, and other things for plant health. And so um, I think, you know, black and clear would be the most common you would see used in a home garden setup typically, but there are other um, there are other options out there. And you can also use landscape, um, landscape fabric, newspaper. There's, there's all kinds of options, but um, those are just some of the benefits of mulch when it comes to dealing with your, your, gar your garden beds. And this is another resource that's included in that table, but it basically is kind of an easy reference when it comes to if you're trying to figure out, oh, well, I want a three inch deep layer of whatever material I decided on and I have this much of an area to cover, it can help you um, calculate how much you would need if it's something that you're having to purchase or, or haul in. So um, that's everything on, I was gonna touch on with soil. If there's any questions on that topic, please you know feel free to speak up or put it in the chat. And um, I'm gonna move on, otherwise I'm gonna move on to talk about water. So basically, when we're dealing, when you're dealing with water in your garden, you're, you're probably either trying to collect it, divert it, or conserve it. And so there's several options, you know, and it, it can be a fun, you know, exercise in gardening and staying flexible to know what, what's it going to be in any given year, and it may even change throughout the year. In the spring, you may be more worried about um, diverting water if you've got heavier rainfall. In the fall, you know, into the summer, you're worried, you know, we want to have some collected. Maybe we're worried about conserving. Maybe we've entered a drought. So there's going to be um, some differences throughout the season, but also just depending on your site. So again, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail about any of these particulars but please feel free to ask questions. And like I said, that resource list will have more specific resources on all of these things. Um, so when, like I said, we're kind of looking at three different things, either collecting water, diverting water, or conserving water. Um, rain barrels are 
a really common way that you may choose to collect water so that you then have it and are able to use it um, for watering purposes for your garden. These are just some pictures of different rain barrel setups. Um, one of our counterparts, Miranda Edge, she actually has a great video that shows how you can set up your own rain barrel. And that'll be included in the email that gets sent out afterwards as well. So if you wanna check that out, it's not, once you've got the container, it's really pretty straightforward to get a, um, to get a rain barrel set up for yourself. And now is a great time of year to be doing it because rain is you know something we've got in plenty right now. But these are some rain barrels. Um, now, so that's kind of the collection side of things. You may have a cistern on your property. Maybe you use your pond for watering. There's different considerations depending on the source of water and you know, making sure that it's safe for use, especially in a vegetable garden. But there are a lot of options out there. Now, when we're talking about diverting water, um, even though you, you probably know this, but even though plants need water, there is a such thing as too much of a good thing. So if roots are staying saturated, it um, can really be detrimental to your plant health. So you may, hopefully you've selected a place for your garden that isn't dealing with standing water or a huge amount of runoff, but we've all only got so many places to choose from and sometimes it just is what it is. So there are a number of options for dealing with, you know, directing and diverting water on your property if it's causing an issue with your gardening. These are just a couple pictures of what are called um, grass swales or vegetated swales. Um, but basically a swale, S-W-A-L-E, is a structure, kind of a hill or a little ditch that is used to you know, bring the water into a more concentrated, you know, kind of creating a little stream, but keeping it vegetated so that it helps with erosion. And it also um, helps with, you know, treating the water, getting it to kind of go and be held in the soil there. But you may need to look on your site at what kind of drainage, what runoff are you dealing with um, and making sure that it's being directed appropriately. So there's some resources in that guide that go more into grass swales, bio swales. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of information out there. If water, you know, too having too much water and where it's trying to run off to is an issue for you, there's definitely resources out there to help um, make some changes on your property to deal with that. Another option, and sometimes swales may be used to direct into this, would be rain gardens. And so rain gardens aren't meant, they're not the same thing as a pond. It's not meant to be a big standing water area on your property. It's just meant to be an area where the water is able to be held and contained for typically less than 24 hours while it works its way into the soil, while it infiltrates the soil. Um, but again, this water, if you're having an issue with runoff on your property, it has to go somewhere. This helps to treat it. This helps, again, give it a place where it can be held and effectively infiltrate into the soil. So again, there are a lot of resources out there about rain gardens, if that's something you're interested in, um, especially for, for dealing with runoff on your property. And finally, so that was, we've talked about collection. We've talked about diversion. Now we're just gonna talk a little bit about conservation of water. Um, it essentially, you know, especially as we get into later summer months, water is not, a, you know, never ending. If you have city water, you know, you're paying for the water you're using to water your garden. If you're on a well, or even if you use rain barrels or a cistern, there's a limit to how much water is being held in that kind of, you know, collection area. And so you, you don't just typically use water like it's never gonna run out. Um, so when it comes to that, as you probably know, but I'll say it anyway, in case you haven't thought about it, um, the part of the plant that is using the water is the roots. And so what we wanna do to is anything we can do to direct the water more specifically towards the roots is going to help with water conservation. And so when you are using a sprinkler, 
if you're just spraying indiscriminately, like while that might be quicker, you're obviously getting water all over the leaves. Um, you're using losing water to evaporation just as the hose sprays through the air. So watering like this from a water conservation standpoint really isn't your best option, but you know, it is what it is. Um, if you do, if that is the way that you have to water for whatever reason, um, trying to hold your kind of watering to either first thing in the morning or in the evening is going to be best. And that's true, like purely because evaporation loss is going to be less during those times of the day. So you don't have the sun beating down hot, evaporating the water as soon as it hits the ground or while it's going through the air. Um, another thing to consider is if you're watering like this, try to avoid really windy days because that also increases loss due to evaporation. So if you are able to have a setup, these are called soaker hoses or drip irrigation, and they basically have little holes along the length of the hose that puts out water at a slower rate, but it puts it right out. At, you can see these plants are right up next to the soaker hose. And so it just puts out water at a lower rate directly where it's needed. And that helps control, you know, helps conserve water. And there's a lot of different kinds of drip irrigation systems out there. There's some that are really fancy. There's some that are more simple. There's DIY options. Again, if this is something you're able to implement and you're looking to do, there's plenty of resources out there. I will say, um, Drip irrigation especially is really well combined with mulching. As we talked about, mulching is going to help conserve um, moisture in the soil and it's going to help make sure that, you know, that water is being held there as long as it can be so that the plants have time to uptake it. So those are kind of the three things you may be dealing with when it comes to water. Um, and hopefully those are some helpful thoughts, but again, let me know if you have any questions. All right, and finally, our final kind of set of elements that we're gonna talk about, I'm gonna combine the two, are sun and air. And um, I'm combining them, you'll see why. I think they're kind of related because they both have, plants need air for a different reason with photosynthesis, but when we're talking about gardening with the elements and dealing with nature, um, air has to me has a lot to do with like temperature differences and um, sun does as well. So you may think when it comes to sun, plants, oh, you know, sun is what they need. They need to be out in the sun. But you'll see this is just an example of a pretty basic shade structure that somebody made. And if you can tell what those plants are underneath it. It's mostly like green leafy vegetables. It might be lettuce. It looks like there's some Swiss chard or beets in there um, and maybe some herbs or carrots. Some of those cool season vegetables, especially as you get into the warmer months of summer, that really high, high heat, hot daily temperature scenario is not great for those plants. It can cause them to bolt or go to seed more quickly. Um, and so in those cases, you may be looking at creating a shade structure or planning your garden so that those areas have more shade during the day, just to help extend the season length for those, um, for those types of plants. So um, that's one thing you can think about is just sometimes sun actually can be to the detriment of plants that prefer cooler temperatures and you can implement some options with with structures or with placement of your garden beds that can help you extend the season for those cooler season plants. Um, when it comes to season extension though, probably what if you've ever dabbled in that or read about it or have any sense of it, um, these are probably some of the more common things that you've seen. So either things like cold frames, um, these are row covers, like so this is specifically a hoop supported row cover. You can also just have floating row cover where it's just kind of been laid over the ground. And there's also kind of more solutions that are more targeted to individual plants. So these are, I think the brand name is like wall of water. Um, 
These are some milk jugs that are used, have the bottoms cut off and are essentially used as cloches or little mini greenhouses. And there's other things, these cloches are kind of bell shaped that are intended to be placed over plants, um, especially in the cooler months of the year when you're dealing potentially with frost, freezing and frost still, um, or as we most or all of us experienced last week in April snowstorm. So these are just some options that allow you to do exactly as the kind of name apply, implies, extend your growing season beyond what would be possible just based on our general, you know, outdoor climate. I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about row covers like this because what's cool about them to me is that they can serve additional um, purposes beyond just extending your growing season. Um, a lot of times when you'll see these, like I said, these are called hoop supported row covers. And when you put those into place, you've got a couple of options. You can kind of tell, I think that this one is probably made out of PVC, PVC pipe, like just a white, you know, flexible pipe they use in plumbing. I will caution you that one of the issues, even though it's pretty cheap and it's easy to, for you to kind of maneuver at home, um, one of the challenges with PVC pipe is that it's not typically UV rated, so it's degraded by exposure to the UV rays from the sun, and it doesn't take too many growing seasons for that plastic to get really brittle and it can shatter. Um, so that makes a mess, and it also just means it's something that you're going to have to replace, you know, periodically. Some people will use, there's different versions of PVC. You can paint the PVC, you know, with a thick enough layer of paint so that the UV light isn't interacting with the PVC. Some people use metal tubing and have made kind of bending apparatuses for that. You can use rebar. There's a lot of, again, if this is something you're looking at, it's going to depend on your bed setup. It's going to depend on your ability to work with a given material, your budget, all of that. But um, it can be a really powerful thing for your garden beds. You can see in this bed that there's kind of a piece of rebar or metal sticking up a little way out of the ground. And normally, if you're using some sort of tubing, they would have these stakes set you know, periodically across the garden bed. And then you're just able to like put the tube down on one side, bend it over and slot it on the other side. And that helps it to stay there, but you can also take it off if you need to. But what I wanted to touch on a little bit with, when you're looking at these row covers, maybe you're someone who doesn't do a lot of early season or, you know, like late season gardening. And so it seems like an amount of work or expense that you don't want to mess with. Um, and that's fine. But one of the neat things about these floating row covers is that depending on what you, what material you put over the hoops kind of affects what it's able to do to help you out with your garden. So there's thicker and thinner versions of the fabric that can be put over depending on whether you're dealing with like a hard freeze situation or something lighter. And there's even um, some versions that are pretty open netting that wouldn't provide any sort of frost or freeze protection, but actually help provide protection from insect pests. And so if, especially for plants, if you're dealing with um, like fruit bushes where you've got an issue with birds, um, you know, coming in and, and harvesting the crop before you're even able to get out to it, after pollination is complete, you can use these same hoops to cover those rows to help protect it while it's ripening and make it more able for you to get a harvest. Um, certain crops don't require insect pollination, but are actually damaged by insects coming into the crop, you know, especially if you're thinking about your cabbages, broccoli, all of that. Um, if you've ever dealt with cabbage worm, you know that that can really decimate your crop. And so if you use these floating row covers with enough that have enough, you know, that are transparent enough to allow light through so that you still have good maturation of the crop, then you can um, basically exclude the cabbage moth 
and the caterpillar from even getting in there to lay their eggs to hatch to cause those issues. So um, that's the other thing I wanted to point out is that these hoop structures are not just one dimensional. There's really a lot of things you can do with them once they're in place and they can really help you further other garden goals beyond just season extension. Um, one thing I will say, depending on your goals, um, if you're protecting, like last week when we had that hard, we had kind of a hard freeze two nights in a row, part of what normally contributes to those really low nighttime temperatures is a clear sky no clouds because that is what allows the heat to kind of escape up into the atmosphere. But normally what that means on the flip side is that the next day is gonna be pretty clear and sunny as well. Um, and just as these structures, these row covers are trapping the heat at night, they're gonna do the same thing during the day. So even though it can be a little bit of a pain um, if you're looking at multiple nights of having to cover your crop, you really need to be removing the cover during the day, at least opening it on, you know, one side, giving some sort of vent, essentially, to allow that hot air to dissipate during the day, because um, you can, it really can heat up fast under there if you don't remove it, and then you end up cooking your plants instead of protecting them from the cold, which was your intention. So, I know um, last week we had a really cold night, people had covered, they knew another cold night was coming. And when I you know, drove around my area that day, I saw a lot of the covers just still in place um, because they knew they were gonna have to recover it again, but that can also cause damage, excuse me, if you're not careful. A um, Couple other things. Oh, this is another thing that I saw. Um, the whole idea of the row cover is that the soil is a great, you know, like holder of heat. The soil temperature does not change as easily as the air temperature. And so um, because hot air rises, by putting a cover over your crop and, you know, weighting it down to the ground, you're essentially trapping that rising heat. And so that is what is serving to protect your plants from those cold temperatures. It's not like it's keeping something from the sky off of the plant. And so, especially for trees, sometimes you'll see these kits where it's, all, it's like a bag, you're, you're bagging the top of the tree, but that's not, you know, when you think about how this actually functions about the air cooling and the soil holding heat and radiating heat off to protect your plants, doing, having a setup like this totally defeats the purpose of the cover. It really needs to go over, go down to the ground and then trap that warm air. So I just wonder, because again, that was something I saw last week. And one other piece to consider, um, when we're talking about cold temperatures and frost, it may not be so much of an issue nowadays, but um, a lot of the weather forecasts, you know, they're based out of airports or major metropolitan areas. So if you live in a rural area, or if you've ever, you know, on a summer night, been in the city and then driven out to the country, I mean, you can feel how different the air temperature can be from, you know, a city or like asphalt concrete heavy setting versus a more rural setting. And so um, you may have issues with frost or freezing on nights where that temperature forecast is maybe close, but in, the, in a more urban area, it wouldn't have gotten cold enough, but rural, you're dealing with that. Um, the other thing is that you need to be aware of microclimates on your own property. This is good to think about before you place your garden bed, but over time you'll also just get a sense of this. And that's because cold air not, you know, not only settles just like hot air rises, but it moves through your ground. If you've ever walked, you know, down to your creek or even had little low pockets in your yard, you've probably felt those differences in air temperature. And those are called um, frost pockets or the ponding of cold air. And so you're going to see that happen 
as cold air moves down into low areas. But if you have like dense areas of windbreak or just um, more dense ve vegetation, you know, like part way down a hill, that can actually cause its own little frost pocket. It's not always going to be just the lowest spot in an area. And it can cause, you know, two to four degrees difference in air temperature, which may not sound like a lot, but when you're on that verge, especially when you're dealing with tender plants, that can be enough to make a difference. So that's just something to think about as well. You need to understand your the microclimates you're dealing with on your own property um, when you're trying to protect plants in these early or later parts of the season. Um, this is one of the tables that's included in the resources I'll send out after the talk, but it's just breaking down, you know, very hardy to warm loving plants. And you probably have experience with these things, but um, certain plants need more protection or are more suitable for, you know, early or late planting than others. So it's just something to keep in mind. And then um, one other thing that I wanted to mention that kind of goes beyond the, um, you know, cold frame, row cover, that sort of thing is called winter sowing. And these are, there's some more resources that'll talk about that and what I send out, but these are, you essentially use a jug, plastic jug or bottle of some kind. And especially for plants that need cold stratification, which means they need a period of cold before they can begin to um, germinate or just some of your early greens, whatever, you're basically creating like a little mini greenhouse that you plant with a particular plant variety. It gets set out in the winter, even when there's still snow on the ground and it, um, you know, germination begins. And so this can be, especially if you have the containers, just, you know, as you save your recycling up, it's a lot cheaper. And it's also, um, you can have even better germination success with this winter sowing method than you would with, you know, like starting plants indoor and under lights. So it's a pretty cool concept. It's relatively low, you know, technology, low infrastructure needs. And um, it's something you could, you know, think about exper experimenting with next year as we get into the winter. So that's all that I had for today. Thank you again for tuning in. Thanks for um, your participation or watching the recording. Um, I know that I covered a lot of different topics, but everyone is dealing with, even if we're all dealing with that sun, soil, water, and air, the particulars, the challenges you're facing, those are gonna be different for everyone. So hopefully I've given you some things to think about. We'll get that resource guide sent out to everyone that's registered. And I hope that kind of gives you a framework to start looking into what you might need for your garden and, and making any changes you might want to see. So thank you. Were there, I guess I should ask if there are any questions, I'm happy to take those now as well. Kara, I don't see any in the box, um, but if anybody would like to unmute and ask questions, we're more than welcome to do that right now. All right, well, thanks again. If you think of any questions after this, and you're welcome to reach out to me at my email or definitely get in touch with the extension educator in your county. I know they'd be happy to help as well. All right, well, thank you, Kara, for that presentation today. This concludes our uh, event for today. Our next event will be uh, gardening, Vegetable Gardening 101, which will be held on May the 12th. Uh, so looking forward to our last program in our garden series. So thank you very much. We'll stop the recording at this time.